oh, dermatology, just look at a picture and you'll know. And I'll say, actually, it's not always that easy. We really want to hear about the story. I want to see the patient. I want to get a sense of what's going on. And many times that history is actually more important than just looking at it, even though we, we sort of pride ourselves on being a very visual specialty. Welcome to the Healthy Skin Show with Jennifer Fugo, where we're flipping everything you've been told about your chronic skin issues upside down and connecting you with alternative solutions your dermatologist never told you about. Welcome to episode number 37 of the Healthy Skin Show. Today, we are going to talk about nickel and other allergies that can oftentimes be associated with eczema and how and if taking those things out will improve your symptoms. So should you try these diets and a whole lot of other things with my recurring guest, Dr. Peter Leo. In the meantime, I wanted to share my thoughts on a topic that came up recently in the news as a result of a segment that was done on the Ellen DeGeneres show. Let me be clear. I really like Ellen. I always have. So I'm not here to bash her nor her show. However, I do find that there are times when shows will produce segments based off of their advertisers that perhaps aren't necessarily as thoughtful as we would all hope that they would be. And this is exactly what happened with the segment that they called Mary's Rash. Now, Mary is one of Ellen's producers. From my understanding, Mary is oftentimes giving feedback on camera to Ellen, and Mary apparently has some sort of embarrassing rash that she would probably rather not talk about on camera, especially on a national platform, and as is expected from a show that is oftentimes more based in comedy and lighthearted humor, they tried to create a segment that they felt would be funny, and I'm sure that they got Mary's permission to do this. So for everybody who's upset, just realize that Mary likely had to sign off on this and knew this was going to happen. I'm not trying to justify it, but just realize that all of the things that happen on those TV shows is staged. It's written out. There are scripts. They knew this was going to happen long in advance. So what basically occurred was that Cortisone 10 sponsored that particular segment. They are one of their sponsors. Cortisone 10, for those of you who don't know what that is, is a hydrocortisone cream. The episode could have been about the education of what Mary's Rash really was and how the product could potentially help. And we'll get to the product helping in a moment because I do have a couple thoughts on that as well. However, it was more of a joke and it felt to some degree, at least someone watching this having been in Mary's shoes, If I hadn't known what the TV world was like, it would have felt very embarrassing and I would feel embarrassed for her. And in fact, to some degree, I did feel embarrassed for her while watching this segment, which has actually angered a lot of people in the eczema and rash community as a result of the way that the whole situation was set up and portrayed. And so there has been quite a lot of pushback, especially because they didn't say anything about the potential problems that can result from overusing and misusing topical steroids. Instead, it was this lighthearted segment, which is to some degree fine. However, it doesn't convey the gravity of the situation as well as the potential consequences. Ending up with topical steroid withdrawal is not fun. It is very serious. It has wrecked so many people's lives. For them to promote it as this harmless cream that could merely help every rash that you have is incredibly misleading and in some respects highly irresponsible. So if we put the jokes and the personal spotlight that was shown on Mary the producer, we put that aside for a moment and we just focus on the product itself, we have to acknowledge that there are three problems with the product that people who aren't really looking at the ingredients and don't know any better, aside from just buy cortisone 10 or some sort of cortisone cream, they may not fully understand what some of the ramifications are that result in using and especially overusing creams like this. Those three issues are the fact that there is hydrocortisone in there. I will talk about that more in a moment. 
there are parabens, and there is something called SLS. I'll break this all down for you now. Let's start off with hydrocortisone. That is the active ingredient. It's actually a form of topical cortisol. So cortisol is a steroid hormone that your body makes in your adrenal glands. And you apply this cortisone cream, it's considered a steroid, to the skin in order to reduce your itching, your redness, your rash, etc. I have written an entire article on the issues and side effects that can result in using steroid creams, which I feel so sad that many people don't know about who end up in this world. They just think, I'll just use this topical steroid, it'll fix everything, and that is not necessarily true. I'll share the link to that article in the show notes so you can read more about it, especially because, and I want you to think about this for a second, you are applying a steroid hormone that your body did not produce to your skin. Do you think that it actually just stays on your skin? It doesn't. It's absorbed into your body. And in fact, that additional cortisol that is being applied to your body then becomes intermixed with your own hormones. And there is a lot of research showing that it has an impact on your adrenals and can actually cause harm to them. And it's more pronounced, by the way, this harm in children and babies because they are smaller, they are younger. This is just something to think about. The second piece is the parabens. And if you're not sure what parabens are, they're actually synthetic estrogens that can wreak havoc and mess up your hormonal balance. And the two specific ingredients listed on the label are methylparaben and propylparaben. Those are problems right there. Nobody wants hormone disruption. Not a good thing. And last but not least, and I'm just pulling a few things out, there may be other ingredients in this that are likely problematic as well, but these are the three big ones that I found, is that SLS. That stands for sodium lauryl sulfate. A lot of people who have skin rashes and allergies and all sorts of things react to this ingredient. It actually makes things worse. When you go to the dermatologist and they tell you to buy the sensitive versions of your body care products and laundry detergents, etc., one of the things you want to do is remove SLS from the list of ingredients. So we've got three problems right there. And by the way, I'm not trying to make any person listening to this feel badly that you are using a topical steroid, whether it's cortisone 10 or something else. I used a topical steroid when I was working through my own healing journey. However, I used it very sparingly and as infrequently as possible. And the only reason I knew to do that was because my father, who is a doctor, advised me of that. The dermatologist never did. It's my feeling that there is a growing movement or pushback of patients and advocacy groups that are trying to get doctors to do a better job of educating the public and their patients about how to responsibly use steroid creams should you decide to include them in your regimen. And again, if you do, that's fine, but you have to use them as little and as infrequently as possible. I would love to hear your thoughts after you take a look at the Ellen segment in question. And after you've listened to this, how did you feel watching that segment? Did you think that it was responsible? Did you think it was maybe tasteless or even hurtful? Head on over to the post for this specific episode and share your thoughts. I'd love to have a great conversation with you. Also sharing what you wish the Ellen show and their producers who ultimately created this segment would have known and taken into account before they actually made this segment. All right. So with that said, I think we should dive into today's conversation with Dr. Peter Leo. Hi, everyone, and welcome back. Today, we have a recurring guest. I love this, recurring guests. And he was so kind to come back after his first interview. Um, Dr. Peter Leo has joined us again if you missed that first episode, I just want to introduce you to him really quickly. His name, as I said, is Dr. Leo. He's a clinical assistant professor of dermatology and pediatrics at Northwestern University Feinberg School of Medicine. 
He received his medical degree from Harvard Medical School, completed his internship in pediatrics at Boston Children's Hospital, and his dermatology training at Harvard, where he served as chief resident in dermatology. He knows a lot about the skin, let's just put it that way. And while at Harvard, he received formal training in acupuncture, he's written an amazing textbook called The Integrative Dermatology. And by the way, guys, it's like one of the only integrative dermatology textbooks I could even find. And he's also published over 100 papers. Dr. Leo, welcome back. Well, thank you for having me back. It's great to be back. I know. And, you know, I was thinking about today what I could ask you and like kind of pick your brain. And I thought to myself, one of the most fundamental and basic questions, if I have a rash and I have no idea what it is. And I want to go to the dermatologist, how do I get it diagnosed? I mean, I would assume. So, okay, quick question first. Is it important to know what you have? Yes or no? Definitely. It's critical. That will affect everything in terms of the prognosis, in terms of the treatment, in terms of really being able to figure out what we need to do next. Okay. So if it's now important, the question would be, how do you differentiate one rash between another one? And that is a critical, critical question. Um, That is really the nature of our entire specialty. And uh, I was was sharing with you a little uh, anecdote where I gave a lecture once to a group of emergency medicine doctors. And at the end of the lecture, uh, one of the docs said, could you just boil all that down on a three by five note card for me? And I said, well, I wish I could. That's my entire specialty. There's huge textbooks um, that are devoted to sorting all this stuff out. So it is one of those professions where a lot of it is experience. You can be really, really smart, but because so much is visual, so much is pattern recognition, it really takes a lot of experience to really be able to do this well. That being said, it's not necessarily hard. Um, There's a difference between sort of having to understand a complex diagram about how the kidney works, which is really hard to me, or super complex mathematical equations in terms of pulmonary pressure in the heart. That's hard. Um, Ours isn't necessarily hard to diagnose, but it just takes that repetition and knowledge and experience where you say, you know, I've seen this and this pattern, this distribution on the body, the color of the rash. And then of course, the big part of it is the history. People often say, oh, dermatology, just look at a picture and you'll know. And I'll say, actually, it's not always that easy. We really want to hear about the story. I want to see the patient. I want to get a sense of what's going on. And many times that history is actually more important than just looking at it, even though we we sort of pride ourselves on being a very visual specialty. That being said, there are some tests that sometimes we need to do because, again, this is huge. You know, there's, there's hundreds and hundreds of diseases and I have a great picture from when I was in training. One of my teachers had a a series of books on his bookcase, and it was probably three feet of books, giant set of books. (laughs) It was called A Brief Course in Dermatology. It was just just hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of pages. Uh, And it's really interesting. So we do have to do some testing sometimes. You can get it narrowed down to certain areas. Say, okay, this is definitely an inflammatory condition that seems to be involving this level of the skin, but we might need to do a test. Usually our tests in dermatology are going to be things like a skin biopsy. We're going to take a piece of the skin. And unfortunately, sometimes patients expect that to be like a computer reads it and it gives us a printout, but actually it's not. That's another doctor, a pathologist, ideally a dermatopathologist, a pathologist with special training in skin pathology, which you can imagine people spend many years doing this stuff, then they'll say, you know what, it looks like it fits best with this. So it's not so much like a blood test where you get a number, it's really an interpretation. And then we make this clinical pathological correlation to work together to say, okay, what does it look like to you? Yes, that fits. Or no, that doesn't make any sense. You know, this is totally wrong. This wouldn't happen on, on the back of the arm like we're showing it here. So we got to think again. Then the pathologist said, wait a minute, what about this? And we say, yes, that fits. So we really have to do this little dance sometimes. Other times, it's what we call an Aunt Minnie. And this comes from a, a term that how do you recognize your Aunt Minnie or your, your Uncle Bob? You just know them. It's like, hey, Aunt Minnie, you didn't, you didn't have to do a test. You didn't have to check her wallet. You knew who it was. So certain things we see over and over and over that when I walk in or when the patient's being brought back to the room, I say, I know what they have. So sometimes it's very easy and other times it's more nuanced. For atopic dermatitis, we are lucky. It is one of those conditions where it is almost always an ambiny. We know it when we see it for the most part. Sometimes patients are disappointed, like, aren't you going to do some blood work? And I say, well, I can, but I don't know what to do. I can check your, I can check your blood count. I can check your vitamin D level, but this is something I can make a diagnosis with just looking at you and hearing your story. Other times, so I'm worried that there could be something else. And so we will need to do some of those testing, uh, those tests to make sure we know what else is going on. Yeah. And that, that said, um, one thing that's interesting is that sometimes people seem to be reacting to stuff that's in their environment. And I was curious to get your take, especially for somebody that has eczema, like say a pretty 
severe case. What's your thoughts on doing like um, IgE environmental allergy type testing? Is that a good idea or worth it? I think it is a good idea. If for no other reason, it just kind of helps us put things into the proper category. It can be a dangerous rabbit hole. And I think mm-hmm. for me, the big piece is what I found is that allergies are extremely common with atopic dermatitis, both food allergies and environmental allergies. So we want to find these. We want, to, of course, we want to avoid those things. But that's not the same as being the cause. So a lot of my patients are quite convinced. They're like, this must be from a food. Find the food. Right. And we're done. And I always say, I wish it were that easy, but I can tell you again, just from the heart, the school of hard knocks, right? Experience of patients who've gone really extreme, gone crazy diets for six months. I've had patients in the hospital where we can control their diet really well, better than most Mm -hmm. people can do it on their own, but they still have eczema. And so uh, to a certain extent, by definition, atopic dermatitis, we're talking about it, should not be caused by a single food or food. If it is, then we'd say, oh, wait, actually, you didn't have atopic dermatitis. You had an eczematous food allergy. And that's really rare and really different. So most patients who have that will say, gosh, every time I eat this food, I break out in this terrible eczema kind of rash, but otherwise I'm fine. So it's a very different history, right? They're basically clear and then something happens and bam. Oh, As opposed to atopic dermatitis, which kind of does its own thing. Usually it's still there to some extent, no matter, even if they're clear, they often still have a little bit of abnormal skin and then things can flare it up. So in this, you realize this is complicated. It's not easy, which is why the job is hard. And a lot of doctors don't want to deal with this. It's like, this is a big mess. We don't have the clearest answers. And so we kind of work together. I say, look, we're going to try to find those foods. We're going to try to find those triggers. We're also not going to get sad if you're avoiding everything. Because many times we'll find things. We'll say, yes, you're allergic to this. You're allergic to that. We're avoiding them. The patient comes back and they're totally depressed. They're like, I'm avoiding this stuff. And I still have eczema. I say, I know. So we're going to still work on treating it. The truth is, though, if you are exposed to something that's making it worse, sometimes the treatments will fail. And I've had that situation, particularly with topical allergens, so what we call contact allergens. Now, this thing, things get really tricky because there's kind of two major groups of allergy that we test for in eczema. The first are the ones we're thinking about with like, you know, hay fever kind of stuff. Like so mold and grass and pollen. Those are the ones we can get by a blood test or the prick testing where they just kind of poke your skin and watch you for a half an hour. Those are the immediate type hypersensitivity reaction. So they're going to give you a hive type response. And those can certainly make things worse, but they don't cause necessarily eczema per se, because again, it's just a hive and it goes away. So if you were exposed to like, you know, dogs or cats, if you're allergic, you get itchy and you get hivey, but then when they're gone, you're okay. Now that maybe triggered you. So now you've started scratching and your eczema gets worse. But the second kind of allergy is called a delayed type hypersensitivity or delayed type allergy. And these are things that are chemicals that touch the skin and then cause an eczema reaction. So these are things, the classic example might be nickel. So people wearing nickel metal jewelry, maybe on their watch or their earrings, they get eczema where it is. Mm -hmm. And if you remove that, it goes away. So that contact dermatitis needs to be tested differently. It's very different kind of testing than the prick testing because prick testing just looks at a hive. We have to do what's called patch testing. We put patches on their back and each patch is a little tiny well it looks like a little disc we put the chemical in there and we stick it against their skin we hold it against your skin for for two days and we peel it off we look and we say where did you get eczema and sometimes it's amazing we'll say look you're allergic to nickel or commonly you're allergic to things and creams and ointments yeah. and gels and products we say cocomidal purple betaine it's in all these shampoos and foams it's like, oh my gosh, you have to avoid it. Or MCI, this methylchloral isothiocinolone is this common preservative. Tons of kids are allergic to it. So this can be both a trigger and sometimes it can actually be a, a masquerading thing. You know, it's like, wait, this is actually not eczema. You're just allergic to this. And when you pull it, they're better. But most of the time, kids who have their proper history and adults that have the proper history of having chronic eczema, these can just be things that make it worse. And so we still want to do it. We want to sort these things out, but they unfortunately tend not to be the whole story for most of the patients. Right. And actually, can we just delve a little deeper into the nickel issue? Because I get a lot of questions about that. And I'm sure you're familiar at this point with the the nickel that can be found in certain foods. And so people have asked me, um, you know, hey, my ears get really funny or my, my skin gets really funny from wearing cheap jewelry. Do I have to avoid all of these foods? Like, can the foods that contain nickel cause the same reaction as the metal touching your skin? What are your thoughts on that? 
It's, it's a great question. And the answer is yes, it can for some people. Um, the nickel-free diet can be used, particularly in severe cases uh, where I know they have a strong allergy and dermatitis. Sometimes people will get what we call dyshydrotic eczema, the little blisters. Mm-hmm. I've honestly had patients who, when they cut nickel, they are just so much better. The hard part is it is a really tough diet. If you it eat is. it, it's a lot of food. It Can't, is. Like, I looked cool. at it and I was like, I'm gluten-free and like basically everything that I eat. I cannot have. <laughs> so I, yeah, that's it. So I feel terrible when I recommend it for patients and I say, you know, let's give it like only, I try to keep it as short as we can. I'm like, can we try it for just like a month? And the big thing about that is some people would say, well, you might need longer. I agree. But if you do it for a month pretty well, then you add it back. If you have a big flare up, then I feel like that's a pretty good testing. That's sort of approving. I'll say, eh, I think you probably, this is contributing. If you do it for a month, no matter what happens and you add it back and you don't notice a big flare, I'll say it's probably lower risk for you. You probably don't have to worry, mm. um, but it is hard, as, as we say. So I try not to do it much each year. And to put it in perspective, I see a lot of eczema patients every year. And each year, I probably only have to recommend that diet a handful of times, maybe five times total. Oh, wow. So the vast majority of patients, I feel like we can get them better. They don't have to worry about it. And that's the other piece. You know, you read on the internet, you read something and you kind of grab onto it. It's like, maybe this is for me. Right. But Part of my job is to sort of help put it into perspective because it would be it'd be great. I mean, I wish then we'd be done. We don't have to worry about it. But for most patients, that's not at least doesn't seem to be the answer. And so I try not to get up false hopes. Uh, and I appreciate that because in my world of clinical nutrition, a lot of times people want to just keep taking out more foods. <laughs> so they're already on a really limited diet. And I'm like, wait, hold, hold the phone here. <laughs> we need to back up a little bit because. Also, too, you can be missing critical nutrients that are also necessary for your skin to, you know, rebuild helpfully. Um, and it just in general for your body, um, it also makes it really difficult. I mean, you already don't feel well when you have skin rashes and then you're sort of isolating yourself further. So I, I just feel from a social and physical and even mental standpoint, doing incredibly restrictive diets, unless they're, they're very very warranted is not always the best way to go because it just causes more stress. And that's where I need you too, because right, the patients will get on these super strict diets and I'm like, I don't know if nutritionally this is sound, you're going to hurt yourself. You know, as you know, you can cause, you can go too far. So that's why we need a person who understands nutrition to help them balance it and put things in perspective. Well, so let's talk a little bit about some more of these natural options. Like I love the fact that you have training in acupuncture. (laughs) That is so cool and so different than most doctors that I know through my dad being a physician and just in general. So what are some of your favorite like kind of natural things that you would use with patients that, you know, if I went to a dermatology conference, they, you probably would never hear them talk about, but like you found that they might have some efficacy or, or should be considered Absolutely. A couple of my favorite things. So I do feel very strongly that stress brings out eczema in a lot of people. So stress reduction techniques like meditation, Tai Chi, yoga, it sounds kind of goofy. Some of those patients roll their eyes, yeah, but it's really, so believe it, it helps for some people, yeah. right? Um, another thing that I really like in terms of natural products, I feel that most of our patients are probably a little bit low on vitamin D. So I like them to take a vitamin D supplement. There have been a couple of papers showing both with atopic dermatitis, but also with hives, you know, they're kind of closely related in a lot of ways that if you supplement D, some patients get better. And over the years, I've had a few patients really say this made a huge change and it's pretty safe. I don't go overboard. You know, I'm doing over the counter type supplement. Um, plus we're in Chicago where half the year it's pretty gray. So I don't feel too bad about doing that. My other thing that I love um, topically is I love using sunflower seed oil. You were saying that the last time, sunflower seed and what's the next one? And coconut. Okay, great. I have a little mixture that I make um, here, but patients can just do it themselves. Just get yeah. good, good quality, you know, uh, organic sunflower seed oil and like a cold pressed coconut oil, and you just kind of mix them together. They both have properties that are really, really nice in terms of atopic dermatitis. The sunflower seed oil is a very good moisturizer. It has a lot of good fats that help rebuild the skin, and it's also a little bit anti-inflammatory, which is great. Um, and then the coconut oil is fascinating because it has antibacterial properties. And so by doing that, we kind of get rid of some of the bad bacteria, the staphylococcus bacteria on the skin. And I'm pretty convinced that it, that it can help. Now, it's not enough 
to, you know, right. treat some exactly. morning, but it's a really nice adjunct. So I like that in uh, for a lot of patients. I feel like I can boost them a little bit and then I can use my other traditional treatments as well. And I think that's an interesting point that you bring up because I think I worry sometimes when people hear somebody like yourself or myself or any guests on the show, they think this one suggestion that we give will be like, that, like, oh, put this oil on your skin. It's going to fix everything. And that's not the case. It oftentimes is like, I call them protocols, but there, there, there's a number of things that go into resolving or helping to really manage a, a situation or a condition that somebody has. And I think it's important that they remember that not to go, Oh, I should take nickel out of my diet. That's gonna that's gonna solve it, or I'm gonna put this on my skin. Would you agree with that? A hundred percent. And in fact, sometimes I, I worry that I overwhelm people because when they come and see me, I give them a whole plan, and it has the kind of cleansers to use and the moisturizers to use and the, the topical therapy and I'll have some lifestyle pieces. And so people also feel wrong. I say, the problem with this condition is it's not a one hit thing. So we really want to get it from all sides. And that's part of being integrated too and holistic. We're trying to take care of everything instead of just giving you the one thing or removing the one thing. Because if it were that easy, people would have figured it out. Exactly. Well, thank you so much for joining us. I hope this will be maybe a little bit of a trend. We'll have you on to keep, you know, I, I love the fact that you are, you're kind of straddling both of these worlds, which is really nice, but you're at a major university. <laughs> like you, you're really in there helping to change the way things are. And hopefully, I, I, my hope is that over the next few years, we'll really see some change in the way that conventional dermatology is addressing these issues and providing people maybe some of these alternatives and options as opposed to just like, here's a steroid cream. <laughs> I don't know what to tell I sure you. Hope so too. I love it. And um, yeah, thank you for having me. I'd love to come back. And I'll just encourage people to look up the National Eczema Association. Mm -hmm. It's a nonprofit organization that has a lot of clearinghouse stuff. And I'm pretty active there. I write a lot there so they can find a lot of my writings on that site. Yes. And I also want to mention to everybody who's listening, you can also find Dr. Leo at chicagoeczema.com. He's also got a Facebook page and a Twitter page, and I'm going to put links to everything, including that wonderful textbook he authored, by the way, guys. I was just like so impressed when I was looking through the, I was like, oh my gosh, he's talking about botanicals and all sorts of things. This is amazing. Um, so it's just really exciting to me as a nutritionist, and I know that some, while most people listening are the patients, I do know that there are people who are clinicians or practitioners and are looking for other solutions to help support these folks. So I'm glad to help everybody. So maybe we can all help each other to find um, more joy, more, 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 better skin in life. So thank you, Dr. Leo. I really appreciate your time. Thank you for having me. Talk to you soon. As always, it is such a pleasure to have Dr. Peter Leo on the show. I know that he is coming back for another episode, so stay tuned because he will be on again. Yes. If you are thinking that you missed something and there's a link or some sort of resource that we talked about, remember everything for you is in the show notes for today. Don't forget, go leave your comments, whether it's for Dr. Peter Leo, for myself, or you want to talk about that Ellen segment. Happy to have this discussion with you. Just head over to the post that holds this episode. We can have that discussion there. With that said, I really appreciate you tuning in. And of course, always pass this information along to somebody else, right? I share with you, you guys share with everybody else. We all help one another. It's a growing community and I love that. Sharing is caring. Don't forget to subscribe to the podcast and head on over and leave a review on whatever platform you are tuning in on and I will see you in the next episode. <laughs>